Now, last week, we talked about sex. Lots of sex. Sex, 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 and more sex. All right, we'll let that go now. Today, we're not talking about sex. That was last week. You missed last week? Oh, well. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, get the CD. That's what I used to always say. Well, then it was, first it was get the tape, and then it became get the CD. You know, what is it now? Go to the website. See how we just keep progressing. We're such modern folks in regards to this stuff. All right. Let me get you into it here. Seventh chapter, 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Let's start there. Paul says, now concerning the things about which you wrote, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. We discovered last week that what Paul is, is into here, especially in the seventh chapter, is answering questions that came from a letter from the Corinthians in particular. And now he's going to sort of go through each one of those questions and each one of those scenarios. And so he starts off by saying, yeah, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And in this case, he's talking about an unlawful touching. He's talking about a fornicating type of touching or a touching sexually that's outside of marriage. We discovered this last week. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, you would think that that would be like common knowledge, right? But we discovered that with the folks of Corinth because they were such illicit people and um, sex had such a, a large place in their society and in their lives, probably worse than what we have in our society uh, at this point in our culture. But it was so bad and so loose that he actually had to say, yeah, that's right, you should not be unlawfully touching somebody that you're not married to, which is what he means right here. But then he's quick to say, but because, verse 2 of not immoralities, I don't like that. It's porneos, because of fornications. Immoralities is too, too general, too banial. Because of fornication, because of sex outside of the married syndrome, then each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. Paul, on the one hand, we discovered, it's almost like he's saying, in order to avoid this, man just likes to have wholesale marriages. You know, just get married, you know. He's not really saying, let's just jump right into it, but he's saying marriage is the natural place where this is to take place, where sexual contact is to take place. And so it is legitimate to, you know, so one does not fall into areas of fornication, that you need to contemplate and ask God to help you come to the right person so that you might get married, so that this does not become a problem outside of marriage. And then he starts speaking about the fact that there is authority and responsibility and duty sexually within the marriage circumstance. Verse 3, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, likewise also the wife to her husband. Um, there is the aspect of, of uh, the responsibility of he has desires, she has desires, and you need to enter into marriage and see it that way. And I talked to you last week about the fact that I myself have counseled people that, you know, if you're not planning on having sex regularly, consistently in your marriage, then there's no point in you getting married. Now, I'm not talking about folks that, you know, uh, have got physical problems or there's some sort of a legitimate issue that stops all of that. I don't know, maybe old age and you, the, the desire is off or something like that. Uh, I'm not talking about things like that. I'm talking about this is what is normal and natural. And you need to be planning on this. And uh, if you are not planning on this, then tell me now because we need to stop this and take this in another direction. This is the normal God-honoring thing to do in marriage. God created it to be this way, and we talked about that in, in some detail. Verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And interesting how he uses the Greek word exousia here. Authority in regards to um, uh, the, uh, the right, if you will, in marriage to sex. And this, of course, is not being stated in the sense of you know, look, this is my right, so let's go. You know, it's not that. It's an understanding that God has created 
each other for the mutual satisfaction, one of, one of another. And there is this aspect of ownership, as it were, relative to uh, your spouse's body. And each of you need to see it that way. I also talked to you last week, on the other hand, you know, it's not love and it's not right to insist that if, if, some, if your partner is sick or, or, you know, got the headache or something like that, that you force this on them. That is not love. And I'm offering you that free of charge, even though Paul doesn't talk about that in so many words right here. But there's an issue. The issue here at Corinth is that some thought that, well, maybe in my marriage, maybe it's best for me to just not involve myself with sex with my spouse at all. Maybe I will be more holy, set apart to God, you know, because, gosh, this thing is just all around us in our society here in Corinth. And Paul is having to say, no. There is celibacy, which we're going to talk about today, but there is no such thing as celibacy in marriage. Uh, No, Uh, there is no such thing as that. And he actually has to say to some of these people in verse 5, stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time. They were actually um, um, doing exactly that, not having any sexual contact And, of course, this was causing problems in the marriage. I cannot tell you the amount of couples I have counseled over the years where this is such an issue. It it, it is usually one of them, not both of them, because if it was both of them, there would be no issue. They would never talk about it. It would just be what it is, you know. Uh, That's fine. But it's like one of them has just sort of flipped the switch, if you know what I mean, to the off position knowingly that it's causing their partner, you know, some problems. Um, And it's always been amazing to me that, you know, I have to talk to people uh, about this. Usually they let some thinking get into their heads, you know, or it could be anything from some sort of wrong, hyper-spiritual, false spiritual idea about not having any sexual contact because, you know, it's more holy. That's wrong entirely. Um, The most holy thing you can do in marriage is to ratify the marriage. Hello? That's one of the most holy things you can do, is ratify the marriage sexually. Again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Remember Proverbs 5. Remember that whole thing. Be enravished, you know, with the wife of your youth. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Remember I kept repeating that, that one Sunday, okay? Um, it's important for us to hear that. It really is. This is God's word in in regards to that subject. Um, So stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time, just for a time, so that you might devote yourselves to prayer. The words in fasting are not in the Greek. And then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. It's just a matter of fact, you know, that there is, especially at this church in Corinth, these people had a lack of self-control when it came to this subject. And so married couples stood in danger of one of the members of the marriage stepping out, you know, into uh, a, an unlawful, adulterous type of situation. Remember, fornication is not adultery. Those are two different words. They mean two different things. Very important. But but they would actually be tempted to step out, step away outside of their marriage and fulfill that sexual urge you know, in an illicit way. And he's got to tell them, you've got to come back together again because of your lack of self-control. And then verse 6 is where we ended last week. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. I don't like that translation. What Paul is saying there is I'm saying, what I'm saying is this. And the this refers back to come back together again in verse 5. That this, come back together again, I say by way of um, mutual understanding would be better. The Greek means to think the same thing. So that you will think the same way. What way? What, what, you're going to take a break for spiritual reasons. So some form of prayer that is unusual, not usual, but unusual, and then agree to come back together and think in these terms, have the same mindset, so that I don't have to actually order you to do it. That would be a better way of translating this. This I say so that you will think the same way, so I don't have to order you to think this way, is Paul's meaning right there. Which then brings us to verses 7 through 13 today. And your outline, if you've got that there, you should. 
as we are considering now the coming together and the coming apart of some couples at Corinth. I want you to know it took me a while to come up with that title, and I want you to feel good about that. Okay. The coming together and the coming apart of some couples at Corinth. The first thing out the gate, like I said to you, is he wants us to consider the celibate. Celibacy, no involvement, no need for a married partner, no need for that sexual uh, involvement uh, on that level. There is a legitimate gift for this. Paul, Paul talked about it. Paul said he had it. You know, it's just, it's just there. Um, I've never met anybody with it. I think it's probably uh, few and far, far between that, that anybody actually has it. And yet sometimes you come across, you might know somebody uh, who uh, is a believer and uh, they're just, they're fine. You know, they've never been married. They have no need to be married. You know, and in the church today in America, you're considered somewhat of a, of a you know, kind of pariah like like you're out of it if you're not getting married and you're single all the time and the idea is like well what's wrong with so and so you know they can't seem to hold on to anybody or something like that so it's kind of the other way but here at Corinth there were folks that um, some of them may have had that gift of celibacy others wanted to have it others made like they did have it some of them were single but some of them were in married states thinking that they were celibate, and Paul has to correct them uh, in regards to, to that. So we're going to consider the celibate and what that really means, first of all. And secondly, we will be considering a specific couple here. Uh, considering a specific couple. It's going to be surprising, but the way Paul's Greek reads right here is he has in verses uh, 10 and 11 a specific couple in mind that he gives the instructions to that he does in verses 10 and 11. And then thirdly, we'll be considering the rest of the congregation. Here's where we enter into the importance of that word, sunyo dekeo, sunyo dekeo, which you've heard me talk about before, but it's been quite a while. And this has to do with uh, uh, couples. Uh, one was a believer, one was not a believer. The assumption is, is that um, they were both unbelievers when they got married, and then one of them came to faith in Christ, maybe through Paul's preaching or something like that. And then the question was, should I stay with this man? Should I stay with this unbelieving man or unbelieving woman, as, as the case might be? And so much damage has been done to individuals, people in the church who are married to an unbeliever. These verses, verses 12 and 13, have been used to really damage uh, uh, people, Christians, and I don't care if it's well-meaning or not, um, we need to be doing a whole lot better job of studying this passage out and working with the Greek right here before some of these guys get up into these pulpits and start talking the way they talk in regards to what they think this means by what it says. And I have, um, I, I'm at a place in my life where I've seen so much damage done by this, I've really kind of lost all patience with anybody that says the opposite of what I'm going to tell you. That's right. I've kind of, all my little uh, areas of graciousness of it's okay to disagree with me here or there, yeah, it's gone now when it comes to this subject right here because it does too much damage. It just hurts too much. And so we will talk about the importance of that as we move through that. Let's consider verse 7. Let's talk about considering the celibate here. He says, Yet I wish, or I will, that all men were even as I myself am. I guess we better read through the whole text. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But to the married I give instruction, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. Let's keep going. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, 
And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband, for otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, departs, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. We're not going to go quite that far today. Um, You can see uh, where this is going. These are difficult passages, admittedly so. Um, For... uh, for every two or three commentaries that are that agree together as to the meaning, there are at least two or three more that say something else, and then there are two or three more that say something else on top of that. So this is one of these touchy areas, you know. I I this is one of the areas in the, in the text of Scripture which, frankly, for for all of my Christian life, I have studied and struggled over. Sometimes I have felt like I've come to a right place with it, and then I found, no, I'm doing it wrong, I'm getting this part wrong, I'm not considering this. And this has happened a few times in my life. Um, I feel that at this, I'm at a place in my studies right now where I've I've chosen to die on a hill. And the reason I've chosen to die is not because, um, well, i got to pick a a position, so I, I guess I'll pick this one. No, it's because I have become utterly convinced of a correct interpretation in regards to these passages. What I'm going to say is not the usual thing. And that's the spirit of Puritanism, by the way, is the willingness to grab a hold of the text of Scripture and and allow something to be seen that is not normally seen or is not necessarily agreed upon. But if there's enough valid exegetical reason to reach in and expose a thing, then we should be doing that. And let the text say what it says. And let God's people listen. And let them judge accordingly as they compare what is being taught to them with Scripture. And let them be diligent students of the Word. Now, that's the spirit of Puritanism. And that's what we need to be about, I think, in my opinion. Let's consider the celibate first of all as we continue now in verse 7. I wish, Paul says, that all men were even as I am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and one in that. He's kind of responding to the first six verses where he's having to tell these married folks, stop depriving each other. You know, he has authority over your body, she has authority over you know, your body, and so on and so forth. And Paul's kind of leaning back going, man, I'm kind of glad I don't have to deal with that. That's what he's saying. I'm kind of glad that I don't have to deal. He says, I will, it really should be will, I think, instead of wish, I will that all men were even as I myself uh, am. Paul is stating his preference for the benefits of a single Christian life. That's what he's talking about right here. This is his opinion. And it's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing wrong with it. And it's not a contradiction. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, is not saying one thing and then saying something else. He's not saying, you know, single life is better than married life. He's not saying married life is better than single life. He's saying that each man has his own gift. Or each woman has their own gift. But you need to recognize where that gift is. What is the benefit of a single life anyway, as a Christian? What's the benefit? Um, I think if you move through the text and you get yourself down to verse 32, 32 through 35, you'll see what he means by this because he picks up the subject again down here. Verse 32, he says, But I want you, all of you, to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Well, that's right. Then he says, but one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Now, he's not saying that that's wrong because he just opened up the chapter saying how to please your wife, husbands, and and wives, how to please your husband. There's a place for that. But now he's talking about something else. He wants to eliminate distraction from Uh, that would be away from the things of the Lord. Uh, Let's let him build this a little bit. Verse 34, uh, 33. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin, uh, you know, all marriageable age but hasn't been married yet, is concerned about the things of the Lord as Christians that she may be holy both in body and spirit. Now, he's not saying that it's unholy, you know, to have sex, you know. 
<laughs> He's just saying that they are not having to consider that. Now, if you are married, the holy thing is to consider that. He just said that earlier. But now he says um, that she may be concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband, which is a repeat of what he said in verse 33. Uh, Verse 35, this I say for your own benefit. Now watch, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate. I'm not trying to tell you that you need to be single, but you're feeling like, no, I need to be married. He says, I'm not trying to restrain you in regards to something like that, um, but it, it... but if you're if you are not needing that and you can do a single life, he says uh, that could be an appropriate thing. But here's the here's the point. Bottom of thirty five. I want to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Let's read thirty five again. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. See, that's it right there. Those are important words at the bottom right there. Uh, The fact remains is that if you are by yourself, uh, you know, uh, pretty much do whatever you feel the Lord would have you do. You you don't have another person there that you have to consider and, you know, but there's there's a negative side to that too, by the way, because there's a strength that comes from that other person being there, okay, and there's a whole headship thing, and there are blessings um, that the Word talks about in a marriage that uh, a person who is single doesn't get to participate in, but God has other things uh, for the single person, and I totally respect somebody, uh, a Christian, male or female, you know, who believes that they are to be in this single state, and I think that there are people uh, in in the church who were previously married who now, for whatever reason, find themselves in a single state, and they prefer to stay that way. Uh, I'm, I totally support that. If you don't feel like you need to, to get married, uh, then don't. That's perfectly fine. Un, I mean, just totally undistracted devotion to the Lord. You, be, you know, God says, pack up and go to India. You can go. There is no other person to consider. Right? I mean, we could go on with this. So there is a place for uh, the celibate situation when Paul says what he says. Now, slip on back to verse 7 here, and middle of 7, he says, However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner, another in that. Um, The word gift there is charisma in Greek. It's the same Greek word that we're going to come across in chapter 12 when he starts talking about the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit there, this is one of them. Um, And like all gifts, this one is subject um, uh, to the user and is for the benefit of others as well. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that this gift of celibacy is not just for you, the individual that God is giving it to. Uh, It is for the benefit of others too. In other words... In other words, for ministry, for somebody who has undistracted devotion to the Lord, for ministry, they have this gift of celibacy. Like I said a little bit earlier, if God's calling you, you know, to go preach, you know, in Japan, you can go do that or wherever. Um, It is for the benefit of others. Where am I getting that from? I'm getting that from 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7, where Paul says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Notice the Trinitarian uh, aspect here of the gifts. The same Spirit, and there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects or workings, but the same God, who works all things in all persons. But, verse 7, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? For the common good, for the good of everybody else. And then he talks about the charisma and the gifts and how they are for the benefit of everybody else. I think, going back to chapter 7 and verse 7, that the gift of celibacy is a part of that. That's my opinion uh, on that matter in particular. And then he moves on to verse 8, still talking about considering the celibate. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain as I am. In other words... um, 
if you found yourself uh, in uh, your partner has passed away um, and you're unmarried, he's saying you need to consider this. That's what he's saying in verse 8. Think about it. Pray about it. You know, don't be in a rush necessarily to, to remarry. Um, and uh, give that some thought in particular, he says. You know, the Lord Jesus himself in Matthew 19 uh, made some comments about the celibate individual that gets passed by a lot. In Matthew 19, verses 10 through 12, of course, Jesus has just got through speaking um, to the Pharisees, and of course, the boys are right there listening to this. The Pharisees wanted to know, you know, if a man could divorce his wife for any reason. Jesus speaks about the fact that, you know, God made the male and female. Uh, they've been made one flesh. What God has joined together, then no man should separate. Well, then they say to him, why did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and to send her away? That's out of Deuteronomy 24. He says, because of the hardness of your heart, God permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. He wants them to think about the beginning. Forget, forget uh, this, this law, which was a legitimate law. You could divorce legitimately, but it was because of the hardness of your hearts, meaning that uh, your males, you males, the hardness of your heart is going to work itself out negatively against that woman. She's the one that's going to suffer. And so the idea of divorce was so that the woman wouldn't suffer. But then he says in verse 9, And I say to you, all of you, whoever divorces his wife, except, this is known as the exception clause, except for pornea, not immorality, don't like that, except for pornea and marries another woman, commits adultery. So if you divorce your wife and there has been pornea, which is not, in this case, is not a, a, uh, uh, a sexual activity because that would not be pornea, that would be, exactly, adultery. You know, it's amazing to me, and I just got through reading a bunch of commentaries about this again, it's amazing to me the amount of teachers that are out there that think pornea is adultery here, and they and they 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 will go. They'll you'll be he'll say it's pornea, and then he'll talk about the fact that the only way that you can divorce is if there's adultery, and it's like no, that's not what he said. Malchos and pornea are two different words entirely, and they mean two different things. You a, a married person. Uh, can't commit sexual pornea, they commit adultery if they're married. That's adultery. Um, and so what do we do with this? Well, the word pornea also means unfaithfulness. You look it up in any lexicon you want. But it's a wide range of unfaithfulness in the marriage. I'll give you a quick example. Say you're married to some guy, w women, and he wants to be a part of a satanic cult. And he says, you're coming with me. And you go, no, I'm not. And he says, yeah, you are. No, you're not. When he goes off to do it, he wants to lead you into it. That's pornea. That's unfaithfulness in the marriage because he's leading you to do what God says not to do. And as a husband, he has a responsibility to lead you in God's way because marriage is about what God says it is in the word, not what people say. And that's pornea that's working right there. That's unfaithfulness. And ladies, not only... Do you have grounds for divorce? You better run from that guy as fast as you possibly can. And if they're kids, you get them out of there too. Because he's going to lead them and you into a life of hell, hell, hell. The exception clause kicks in right there. Now that may be an extreme example, but you know you get the idea. Uh, pornea has, has the overtones of unfaithfulness in a lot of different areas. How about the guy takes all of your money, um, we'll just make it the guy who's the bad one here, okay? Because, you know, it's easier that way. Because uh, we're all bad. Um, the, the guy takes all of your money, all of your savings, everything like that, everything, right? And he's like, he's like spending it, you know, um, you know, on uh, down to the racetrack, heading out to Vegas kind of a thing. And pretty soon you guys are like poor farmer and the guy doesn't stop. And it's threatening your life. That's pornea. That's unfaithfulness in the marriage. Well, what if the guy's got a little bit of a problem? I don't care if the guy's got a problem or not. It's still pornea. We're defining terms here. We're defining the actions that are taking place, knowingly taking place within the marriage. That's right. It's pornea. Let's say he's, uh, he's buying internet porn or something like that. That's adultery. 
under the old covenant, which is what Jesus was teaching under, you know, that's stonable. It's a stonable offense. That's a death penalty. There's no divorce for adultery. There's death. Not divorce. What's wrong with these commentators? Don't they understand that Jesus is speaking under law here? And in Matthew 5, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. See? And he placed them all under law until he went to the cross. Then it's over with. Then it's fulfilled. Now, new covenant. New plan. Thank God for it. But until then, they're under law. And so when Jesus says, verse 9, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for porneia, unfaithfulness, not a, it's not adultery. There's no divorce, no exception of divorce for adultery. There's death. What's wrong with people? And marries another woman, commits adultery. So if you take the exception clause out, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. See, there has to be the exception clause. There has to be the porneia. Otherwise, you're committing adultery if you just divorce your wife like the Pharisees were doing. Some of them were divorcing, it for, divorcing them for any reason, and they weren't unfaithful reasons. They just wanted another woman. And that's another story for another time. The, the, the boys got this. The boys understood what Jesus was saying because look at verse 10. The disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. Now notice what Jesus is going to say. He said to them, not all men can accept this statement. In other words, he agrees. <laughs> Hello? Don't get married. If this is how it's going to be, and you are, you know, you're not going to be able to get out of this marriage unless there's real biblical pornea on that other person's part. Well, then the boy said, well, it's better not to marry. Jesus says, yeah. In a case like that, yeah. In other words, if you're going into the marriage, not 100%, like these Pharisees were doing, if it doesn't work out, I'll just get myself another little honey. Now watch what he says. Not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it is given. That's a reference to the celibate gift. To those to whom it is given. Now watch this. 12, for there are eunuchs, that's the celibate. And by the way, a male could be a eunuch without being physically altered. Um, watch. There are eunuchs, number one, who were born that way from their mother's womb. They have the gift. They don't need to be married. Simple. Uh, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, forced into it. That's self-explanatory. And three, there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. They have set themselves apart and they have made a determined a vow before God that you know, they're going to serve God. And they are truly, Matthew 5, the poor in spirit. That's who those people were, who totally gave up everything to live for God. And many of these people gave up marriage you know, a as well. And they were known as the poor in spirit. Um, and then for the sake of the kingdom, he who is able to accept this, let him accept it, is what Jesus says on the matter. So Jesus speaks about the celibate. He says that there's a legitimate place for that type of thing. You head back to 1 Corinthians 7, and you look at verse 9. That's why he says to the unmarried and widows, it's good for them to remain even as I. It is good. Look at what Paul got done. Look at all the traveling that he did. Look at all the gospel preaching. Look at all the teaching, the establishing of churches. Paul is recognizing that that, would, that life would have been pretty rough on a family. Hello? Pretty darn rough. But it's not impossible. Peter was married. You say to all your Roman Catholic friends with gusto. Peter was married. According to 1 Corinthians 15. According to 1 Corinthians the ninth chapter. You say Peter was married. Peter's mother-in-law, Matthew, Mark, talk about that. Uh, and it says, you know, that uh, um, it says in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, you know, that Peter and some of the other apostles who were married, you know, had wives that they would take with them on their, their missionary journeys. It doesn't say anything about the kids. You know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, it had to be difficult. It couldn't have been easy. Um, but this is the benefit here. So verse 9, he says, But if they do not have, if the unmarried and the widows, if they do not have self-control, let them marry. If they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn, and then italicized words, 
with passion. Um, you have to be honest about this, he says. If Self-control. If you're struggling sexually, you're a single person, you're struggling sexually, here's a clue. You don't have the gift. <laughs> I've actually had, I had a pastor one time say to me, that, oh yeah, he knew people that had the gift of celibacy, but they still struggled sexually. And I said, they don't have the gift. He says, oh yeah, they have it. I said, dude, dude, I say to this guy, dude, think about what you're saying. It's, if it's a gift, then it's a, char- it's a charisma, it's a gift from God so that you don't have this need. So you don't struggle, see? It's something that is out of the ordinary because the ordinary is to get married and have kids and all that stuff. You know, it's wild. It's wild. There's wild men in pulpits out there. You think I'm wild? There's wild guys out there. <sighs> but if they do not have self-control, he says, let them marry. Uh, the phrase is interesting right there. Let them marry. We've got uh, gameo for for Mary, and it is aorist active imperative. The reason I say that, that it's unusual, and I want to step out of the norm just a little bit here and practice a little Puritanism for you. When it says in our New American Standard that if they don't have self-control, let them marry, because it's aorist, I want to suggest to you that it should be translated, they should already be married. They should already, because that's what the aorist does. They should already be married. If they don't have self-control, then what are they waiting around for? This follows with the rest of Paul's thinking so far with these Corinthians. Like what he says, you know, back at verse 2, because of fornications, each man is to have his own wife. In order to avoid fornication, you you need to get married. So now he says to the same people, you know, verse 9, if they don't have self-control, they should already be married. So Paul is trying to make it very clear for these folks that if they're, if you are married, right, then God has called you to understand that your body is not your own, it belongs to your spouse. Stop depriving each other, right? All right? Uh, if you are married, God has not given you the gift of celibacy, okay? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, pretty simple right there. Well, what if I've, hey, well, what if I've made a mistake and I have this gift of celibacy, but I've already married this person. Too bad. That ship has sailed, baby. No, I kid you not. You are in a vowed situation now, and you have that, the responsibility towards that other person. Ask God to give you a wonderful time in the marriage bed. Period. I kid you not. <laughs> Man, when I was in the Pentecostal circles and charismatic realms, it was like, oh, yeah, but I got this gift, you know. And I'm not kidding. I used to, I've dealt with people like this. I, no, you don't. No. I didn't know as nearly as much as what I know right now about the word, you know. And back then it was like, no, you don't. Yeah, uh-uh, you've got, you got a vow that's going on right here. Which brings us then out of that into our second point, and that's considering a specific couple. Considering a specific couple couple. We're going to hit the gas a little bit here and speed this up, so hang in there with me. Verse 10, but to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife. Um, You're going to want to notice two things. Number one, at the top of verse 10, he says, but to the married to the gamao. Uh, It is a masculine plural. Now that means something when it comes to a translation to Paul's meaning right here. When he shifts this from the the celibate folks, right, and to the widows and and the unmarried, now he shifts this over to the married. He's talking about, he's making, he's directing a statement now to the married men of the congregation. It's more than one man. It's plural. And it's male. It's not to married people in general. We got a problem with that. It should be neuter. You can neuter plural that, and you got married people in general. But you got a masculine plural going on right here. And he's going to offset that with comments now in verses 10 and 11 to a single masculine male, obviously, and single feminine relative to this woman. Okay? 
So we got the male men of the church being called to take note of something. Now watch what it says. But to the married men, that's how I would translate it, I give instructions, not I, but the Lord. In other words, the Lord has something to say to the married men of the congregation relative to a single couple in particular that are going through a specific issue. Which issue we're really not told much about. But Paul now, remember remember chapter 7 verse 1, the things you wrote to me about, remember all that? Paul is now responding to these questions. There is a question now concerning a couple in particular. And Paul is now answering that and he wants the married men to step in and respond to this couple. These would be the faithful married men of the congregation. Once again, well, who's, where's the pastor? Well, there is no pastor. Where are the elders? Well, as far as we know, there are no elders at Corinth. Corinth is kind of leaderless, except for the house of Stephanus, which are in a position, some kind of a position of respect, according to chapter 16, but they're not the pastors, they're not the elders. They're never called that. But there's something going on there. In any case, he calls on the married men to now exercise some oversight and some authority here. And he says to the married men, I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, the Lord wants this done, that the wife, singular, not wives, but the wife, singular, should not leave Corizo, her husband, singular. So what we've got going on here is that the married men are to step in and stop this scenario. She wants to leave her husband. Paul is saying you need to step in and you need to stop this. I believe that's what's happening right here. Men, step in and stop this because this is wrong. It says, this is coming from the Lord, that the wife, one wife singular in particular, not in general, should not carizo her specific husband. Now, carizo, leave there, not koristhani, or mi koristhani, means not to divide, means not to set apart, not to separate. That's what korizo means, divide, set apart, separate. Like the word porneos for unfaithfulness, there's a lot of different uh, ab- avenues and abstracts of unfaithfulness that are biblically legitimate. Same thing is true for Carrizo right here. There are a lot of different kinds of dividings, you know. You can divide yourself from somebody and say living at the same address. I'm going to prove it to you in just a second here, okay. Uh, The reason I put it that way is once again we have this very popular kind of understanding in the evangelical community, then you listen to the average uh, preacher preach on this text and he will start using you know, the fra- uh, phrases like, you know, well, a phrase like desertion, that this is talking about desertion. If he or she deserts the other person, he th- then they think that's what verse 15 is talking about. If the unbelieving one leaves, that's corizo, that's depart. That means to set, set oneself apart. Then let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage to stay in the marriage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. Now that phrase, just in case you're wondering, to stay in the marriage is not in the biblical text. It's something I just said for clarification. Just so I don't get that come back on me like you know he's adding to the scripture or something like that. All right. So corizo, what an interesting, interesting word. Sometimes it means to physically leave, to move from one location to another, to change addresses. Depends on the context. But sometimes it means to just be divided from a person. You know, you and I, right now, let's say, let's say you and I have different points of view in regards to the sons of God in Genesis 4, okay? Um, Let's say some of you, well, that's the godly line of Seth. And I think, you know, it's the result, uh, I think it's fallen angels. Let's say that. Well, we have different opinions. We are corizo over that. We're divided over that, okay? Um, in a household, a couple can be divided over how to raise the children. You can be carizo over that. You can be carizo over how to budget the money. Carizo over that. You can be carizo over the Lord. Right? He could say, 
Uh, no, I think God is in the trees and in the rocks and in the rivers and, you know, and in my John Denver collection of tunes. Um, and she could say, no, there's only one God. His name is Jesus. Well, there's a Carrizo there. Could that lead to a, a place where, um, where he is saying, no, no, I, and I don't want to be married to somebody who believes that Jesus is the only God. Is that Carrizo? Darn right that's Carrizo. Of course that's Carrizo. Of course. We'll get, the, we'll get a little further into this. Uh, so he says here, hmm, same couple being addressed. You know what I should do? I should have you write these down. Hebrews 7 and verse 26 give you some fast examples about how Carrizo is used in different ways. Hebrews 7. And verse 26. Speaking of Christ, listen to this. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest who is holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners. The word separated there is? Yeah, darn right. Carrizo. Did Jesus physically separate himself from sinners? Hello? No. See? Shaking your head. That's a correct. And that's a correct shake. No, he did not. Uh, uh, yeah. Phil over here. No, I'm pointing to Phil. Okay. Phil, Phil's not. No, he, he's not wondering. I'm not sure. So I'll just say this. <laughs> you know, he's going, no, because Je what are they saying about Jesus? Guy eats with sinners, sits down at a table, has table fellowship. See, he wasn't Carrizo in that sense, but he was separated from sinners. How? He didn't sin. <laughs> he didn't participate in the sin that the sinners sinned in. So he was Carrizo. Did he physically move somewhere? No. He just did not participate in that. There was no sin uh, in him in particular. If you make a note of Romans 8, verse 35 and 39, you'll see the exact same thing again. Romans 8, verse 35 and 39. Now head back to 1 Corinthians 7. I just wanted to give you a couple examples uh, about that. So this is fascinating. But, verse 10, but to the married men, I give instructions, not I, this is coming from the Lord, that the wife, a wife in particular, should not carizo her husband. Now, this could mean physical, physically leaving. We don't know in this case, but it could mean that. Verse 11, but if she does carizo, if she does carizo leave, she must remain unmarried. So it sounds like physical departure here, doesn't it? Okay. She must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. Um, clearly, there is circumstance behind this that Paul doesn't tell us what it is. But he comes to a conclusion that you married men, you step in. He must know this gal, like she's going to go off and she's going to try to remarry or something like that. And Paul knows, since there's been no porneos on the, on the man's part, this is going to be adultery on her part if she finds some other guy to marry. See? That's probably what he's referring to, but I can't be 100% about that. She must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not aphenai divorce his wife. That man, just because she leaves, should not consider that, okay, I'm just going to divorce her then. You know, it's like, I'm sick of this, you know, or whatever, and now I'm just going to go out and divorce her. Now, he's speaking directly to this couple in particular. I hope you can see that, and I, and I, I hope you... You don't see uh, me pressing this, you know, out of shape or something like that. I, I'm really convinced that this is the case right here uh, in regards to what is happening, which then brings us to the final point. The final point, considering now the rest of the congregation, considering, uh, considering those who are celibate, considering this specific couple, and now considering the rest of the congregation. He says in verse 12, but to the rest... To the rest of the congregation, I say, not the Lord. In other words, uh, Paul's giving his opinion right here. He's not saying, he's not denying that the Holy Spirit is not inspiring this. He's just saying, the Lord is not, I know of no place in Scripture where the Lord is saying this. Probably what he means. Uh, to the rest, I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents, you know, watch that word right there, consents, to live, mark that one as well, with him, so consents and lives, 
he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, he consents to live with her. She must not send her husband away or send him away. Um, Let's do some quick housekeeping. At the bottom of verse 12, the word divorce, it's the same word as the bottom of verse 11. You guys know Quit drinking so much coffee. I don't know. Either that or they don't want to hear what I'm saying. You know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> See, and I have to let him say that. I can't, I can't uh, deny that or rebuke that. He's right. Okay. <laughs> uh, bottom of verse 11. See where it says divorce. Bottom of verse 12. See where it says divorce. Those are the same Greek words. By the way, the words chorizo and the word for, that's translated divorce, aphenai, they're essential, essentially the same meaning. Um, either way results in a separation. It results in a termination of the relationship. Um, either way. Athenai has to do with sending something away. It also is, by the way, the root for forgiveness, which, by the way, means to send away. <laughs> okay? To forgive somebody or a thing, your sins, my sins, is to have them sent away. Okay? The divorce is an interpretation of the Greek word aphemai. Right here. But sometimes carizo is used for that as well. See, it's one of those touchy things, you know, and this is one of the areas, that's what I said to you from the beginning, you know, that I have, it served to, to make me struggle for years and years and years over this text. Um, uh, and it's only been, I'd say, within the last, oh gosh, uh, oh, seven years, eight years, I think, something like that that I've settled on this and I have never moved and I've never struggled since. This has been the great part of this. You know, it's not a guess. It's just like, bang, that's it. You know, and I, I've never found any reason exegetically to shift from this. And, and my conscience is not just clear, but it's something I feel that I really need to say uh, to the body. And so I'm out there with it uh, in particular. He says, but to the rest I say, verse 12, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife. Now he's, he's opening it up to the rest of the congregation, yes? So we've gone from uh, t- talking about specific celibate people, and we've gone from verse 10 and 11, a specific married couple, yes, uh, that the men, the married men, were to step into to stop this woman from leaving her husband. Now, we're, now he's speaking generally to the rest of the congregation. So this, verses 12 and 13, this applies to all Christians. This applies specifically and in general to all Christians. Whereas, verses 10 and 11, he's specifically talking to one couple. So 10 and 11, I don't believe should be used in a general sense, you know, Uh, covering everybody, a blanket statement for all married couples. I think that's a mistake. I think Paul is talking about what should be done to a specific couple in verses 10 and 11. It should not be taken generally because we don't know the specifics behind this. We just don't know. Ah, but now, but now, to the rest of the congregation. Now it's general, starting at verse 12. If a brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, He must not divorce her. Now, at the beginning of our teaching, remember I told you that there are verses here that have been used, uh, unintentionally so, but the result is is nevertheless damage, that have been used to damage uh, individuals in marriage situations, specifically where they have grounds to get out of them. They have legitimate biblical grounds to end it. And uh, I I haven't talked about this in so many words in this teaching series right now, but the Bible teaches that, number one, marriage is to be permanent, and it's forever. It's not outside of this earthly realm. It's for this earthly realm, okay? But it is, it is permanent. However, here's a funny little uh, tidbit of, uh, of news. Men and women are sinners, and they sin against each other. God has provided in the Word... Uh, for legitimate divorce to take place, legitimately, um, so that, uh, so that <laughs> I'm thrown right now because your, your son is running around there without any pants, and it's slightly entertaining. Uh, he just ran, you know, yeah, you might want to, brother, because here he comes. All right. <laughs> what was I saying? Who knows now? That was, that was too good. I'm trying to finish here. I may have to. I may have to hold this till next week. 
Uh, uh, <laughs> when you're when you're dealing with a with a scenario like this, uh, it's important to catch all the words correctly so that we don't miss this. It says here that if she consents to live with him, King James. What does King James say? Kathy, you got a King Jimmy. If she is pleased, pleased to dwell. I think that's it. Give me a Mary. Yeah. There we go. Okay. All right. We oh, three King James. I don't know what you guys are doing, but all right. Uh, <laughs> she's pleased to dwell. What is that? That is doesn't even come close to what the Greek is. The Greek is now this word that I wrote down in your. Uh, in your outlines. It's sunyo de keo. Sunyo de keo. It's a compound word. It's made up of three words compounded together. Sun, S-U-N, we'll just do it in English. S-U-N, which means together. Sun, together. The midfix is U, which is, we'll just say E-U. It's epsilon, upsilon in, in Greek. But it means good or well. Good or well. Dokeo, our suffix, m- means I think. In this case, to think. Okay, So you put the word together, and it means to think well together. To think well together. What is missed? And I've never heard, I've never heard anybody, except now there's got to be somebody out there that's seeing it and is saying it. Maybe they're afraid. I don't know. But as far as I know, I'm, I'm the only one that I know of who, ta- who talks about this. That the word, when it says here, it's it's sunyo dekeo, she consents to live with him. As you can see, it's been used as a, a hammer for both men and women. That if, if you're in a, let's say you're married to this unbeliever, but he wants to stay in the marriage and, and you got biblical grounds to get out because he's been porneos. He's been unfaithful in some of the ways like I've described to you, right? But, but the Bible says if he consents or if he's pleased you know, to dwell or if she's pleased to dwell, then don't, no divorce, right? Okay? This should never have been translated that way. Never, ever translated that. And I mean to tell you, Marvin Vincent in his word studies in the Greek New Testament points this out. He says translators, they just keep ignoring the together aspect of this, that it requires both of them together to be in agreement, sun yodokeo, to think well together. A.T. Robertson brings it out uh, in his word pictures in the Greek New Testament. I mean, it's out there. This is not, this is all attainable stuff. This is not hidden in a corner somewhere. It's what the Greek word means. But it's, this, it's dependency on English uh, translations. And so, hey, if she consents to live with him, buddy, you can't, you know, there's soon, there's, Porneos here, there's unfaithfulness, but she wants to maintain the marriage. And there he's he's Porneos, he's unfaithful over here, but he wants to maintain the marriage. It says so right there. Lady, you're stuck. You're stuck. It's telling you to stay in the marriage. And this has been used in this way to beat and beat and beat on men and women, but in particular women who are in sinful situations where their husband... Uh, is sinning and practicing unfaithfulness in the biblical understanding of the phrase and they're being made to stay in that scenario. And God's will is for them to not be made to stay in that scenario. Verse 15 says, God has called you to peace. And according to verse 16, Corizo, he in his sinfulness in this case, has already long departed from that marriage and has broken that covenant bond has broken the covenant of marriage. You can break the covenant of marriage, you know, by more than just adultery. It's broken by pornea. It's broken by unfaithfulness. It's broken as soon as as soon as you raise your hand to that woman and you strike her, it's over with. You are required to cover, protect, love her like Christ loves, protects the church. And Christ doesn't raise his hand to that wife of his. It's pornas, it's unfaithfulness, and it's broken right there. Now, does that mean it, that mean it's over with? You have to get a divorce? No, it doesn't mean you have to get a divorce. If if you're of a mind, uh, if the Lord enters into this and changes hearts, um, it can be repaired. Sure, um, forgiveness can take place. Restoration can take place. 
It's just not always possible. Um, and by the way, sometimes I have to enter in and say, I think he's lying. I think he's going to turn on you again. I have to do that sometimes. Um, because that's how people are. They just want what they want, and they're ready to put on all kinds of airs and fake it and this kind of a thing. You know what I'm talking about. And so, consequently, you know, there has to be somebody... Oh, no, it has nothing to do with Lynn. Oh. I'm the one who's sorry. I let that go. He's my angel. Yeah, no, Lynn saved her. This was this is Kathy's deep, dark past, okay? Uh, no, uh, it, it can't be that way. And so he says the same thing in just in reverse, in verse 13, a woman who has an unbelieving husband... He consents to live with her. Again, he, uh, it should be translated, it really should be translated that they agree together. And then, remember I had you, had you mark the word live? It's oikeo. I'm trying to wrap this up quick. I know I'm going kind of fast, and I don't like the way this is coming out. But uh, it's oikeo, and it's the word for home. It's the agreement to be in the home together, to maintain the home together. Okay, agreement over what? Well, you have to agree, not, not well, let's say she's a Christian, he's not, and he's saying, okay, uh, I'm not going to go out and commit adultery anymore, but uh, I'll keep my porn to myself. I'll keep it in the garage. Can we agree on that? Well, no, she can't agree on that. No. When we talk about agreeing together, we're talking about what does God say a marriage is to be? Now, an unbeliever is going to have a tough time you know, doing what God says a marriage is supposed to be. But it's within the realm of reach in any case. But if they agree together concerning what God says a marriage is to be, even if, let's say, he's an unbeliever, then it can, it can, it can last. It can work. I don't know how well. I don't hold out a lot of hope. But I have to leave it right there with at least that much. But there has to be an agreement together as to what God says a married home is. What is the home? See, well, the home is not you, buddy, going out or her going out on the weekends and blowing a bunch of money, you know, across the river at the gambling establishments or something like that. That is porneos. You are being unfaithful to your spouse. You are threatening the financial stability of your spouse. And I have counseled divorce on more than one occasion for something like that when there is a lack of repentance on one of their parts. Don't think for a second that I won't swing that knife in that direction. See? This, this is so incredibly serious. Now, that's not immediate. I'm not pulling the trigger like instantly. You, know, you, you, you think he's... You think he's uh, throwing some money in one of the, you know, one-armed bandit scratch? You need to divorce him. I don't do that. I don't do that. I'm talking about after all steps have been exhausted, see, and there's not going to be any repentance, then it's done. God has called you to peace. If the unbeliever departs, Corizo divides himself or herself, let him or her depart, see? Now, the, because there is no sunyo de keo, when they depart, when they carizo and they set themselves apart, it's because there is no sunyo de keo. They are not agreeing well together. See how that works? By the way, sunyo de keo here in verses 12 and 13, present tense of the verb form every time. So it's consistent forward motion. There has to be, it's not sometimes on the weekends we have sunyo de keo, but the other days we don't. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Present tense. Can't get away from that present tense. That forward motion. Oh my gosh. So we better stop right there. Isn't this intense? You know? And I'm not, I'm just stepping into it right here. I have more to give you, but we'll put the comma there and wait till next week. Father, we give you thanks and praise for all that you have shown us today. Ask, Lord God, that full understanding, Lord, would be all of ours in regards to this subject. And that, Father, we would. Uh, not be misunderstanding. I pray, Father God, that um, if I have not made, made your teaching clear, that you would step in and bring clarity to my brothers and sisters and anybody who listens to this or watches this on, uh, online, that clarity would be there, Lord. And if I need to clarify by answering some questions, Lord, just uh, let that come on and we'll try to make that happen. And so, Father, thank you. Thank you for all that you've shown us. And I pray, Lord... 
For every marriage, Lord, that is here uh, in Messiah Church, first and foremost, that your blessing, Lord God, of stability and strength and love at every level, married love at every level, Lord, would just be increasing, increasing, increasing for each one. And for those, uh, those in our congregation, Lord, who are single folks, O oh Father, I ask that your peace would be upon them in such a great way, Lord, that they can do what Paul said and that they can stop and consider and think and pray if, uh, if you've called them to be single or if they are to be married, Lord, in which case uh, help them to believe you and seek you for their Adam, for their Eve, as it were, and to see you bring that correct person to them. Let them not make a mistake, Lord, and go with the wrong person. So thank you for your protection in regards to that. And Lord, we pray for our children. We're asking, Lord, that our children would be kept from the horrors of divorce. We ask, Lord God, that your mercies would be upon them to be raised as they listen to a teaching like this, to be raised up, Lord, with a a stable understanding of what marriage is supposed to be uh, and as well as what it is not to be, Lord. Uh, let Let them benefit from moms and dads and elders in their lives who will help guide them and oversee them in this regards. So we thank you, Lord, for these things. Let your blessing be made rich on your people today, Lord. And as we uh, take up the morning offering, thank you, Lord God, for how you take care of us in this congregation. Thank you for how you make sure, Lord, that you meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory. And that as we sow much, we will reap much. And if we sow little, well, we'll reap just a little, your word says in 2 Corinthians 7. And so, Lord God, we leave that in your hands and thank you for taking care of us in the name of Jesus. Amen.